As I arrived at the luxurious villa nestled in the hills above Portofino, Italy, I couldn't help but be captivated by the breathtaking views of the Mediterranean Sea. The early autumn air was crisp, and the landscape was bathed in warm, golden hues, a stark contrast to the bustling city life I had temporarily left behind. This trip was meant to be a rare escape, a chance to find some peace and quiet after a particularly demanding year at work. Being a social worker in the United States is no easy job, and the emotional toll had been wearing on me. This villa seemed like the perfect place to recharge. Upon meeting the host, Victor Sokolov, I was struck by the villa's opulence. Every detail, from the ornate architecture to the lush gardens, exuded luxury. Victor greeted me warmly, though there was something in his eyes, a hint of something deeper that I couldn't quite place. At first, I chalked it up to cultural differences or perhaps just the stress of managing such a grand estate. However, as I settled in and took in the serene surroundings, a subtle undercurrent of tension lingered, making me wonder if there was more to this picturesque retreat than met the eye. Over the next few days, I immersed myself in the beauty of the villa and its surroundings. The local cuisine was delightful, and the picturesque landscape provided a soothing backdrop to my much-needed break. However, as I explored the villa, I began to notice oddities that set me on edge. Victor, who had initially seemed hospitable, displayed increasingly anxious behavior. He often seemed distracted, his eyes darting nervously around as if expecting something, or someone. Then there was Sergei, a young assistant who appeared out of place and constantly looked over his shoulder. His nervousness was palpable, making me wonder what was truly going on. One evening, as I relaxed with a book, I heard muffled sounds coming from a room that had been locked since my arrival. Curiosity piqued, I decided to investigate. The door was ajar, and inside, I found a frightened young girl, no older than ten. Her wide, yes. fearful eyes met mine as she backed away, speaking in halting English. Her name was Lena, and through her broken words, she revealed that she was a refugee from a war-torn Eastern European country. My heart sank as I pieced together her story. The villa was being used as a temporary hideout for refugees, controlled by a human trafficking ring. The realization was chilling, and I felt a surge of anger and fear. The next morning, Victor approached me, his demeanor tense and desperate. He admitted the truth. Lena was meant to be smuggled across the border soon, a transaction orchestrated by a local gang led by a man named Ivan Petrov. Victor confessed that he was being forced into this operation to pay off his debts, his voice tinged with both fear and guilt. Then came the ultimatum. He demanded that I smuggle Lena out of the country, leveraging my foreign status and access. If I refused, he ominously hinted at consequences that left me feeling deeply unsettled. I was trapped, both literally and morally. As a social worker, my instinct was to protect Lena and ensure her safety. But the situation was dangerous. Defying a human trafficking ring in a foreign country where I barely spoke the language was a risk I couldn't take lightly. The fear of what might happen if I refused or failed gnawed at me. I knew I needed more information and a plan. But time was running out. The stakes were high, and the weight of the decision was almost suffocating. As the days went by, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The once serene villa now felt like a gilded cage. Unmarked cars began appearing at odd hours, parked just within sight but always too far to see clearly inside. The men in these cars lingered, watching the villa intently. Victor and Sergei's behavior became increasingly erratic. They were clearly terrified, their eyes darting around whenever they were outside. The tension was palpable, thickening the air with a sense of impending doom. It didn't take long for me to realize that these were Ivan's men keeping a close eye on the villa and its inhabitants. The knowledge that we were under surveillance made every move feel perilous, and my paranoia grew with each passing day. Desperate for a solution, I remembered a conversation I had overheard in a local cafe about Maria Ivanova, a well-known human rights activist. With Lena's safety in mind, I discreetly contacted Maria, arranging a secret meeting in Portofino. Under the guise of a casual stroll, we met in a quiet corner of a park, away from prying eyes. Maria was a striking woman, composed and confident, 
with an aura of quiet strength. She listened intently as I explained Lena's situation and my predicament. Maria revealed the full extent of the trafficking network, describing it as a deeply entrenched system with connections in law enforcement and politics. She assured me that she could help Lena and me escape, providing a safe house and plans to transport Lena to a country with more supportive refugee policies. Her calm, methodical approach gave me a glimmer of hope, but the risks were still enormous. Returning to the villa, I was plagued by doubts and fears. My moral compass told me to help Lena at any cost, but the reality of the situation was terrifying. The danger was real, not just from Ivan's men, but from potential legal repercussions. Being caught aiding a refugee in this illegal operation could have dire consequences, including imprisonment or worse. The thought of facing legal action in a foreign country, where I had little understanding of the laws, was daunting. Yet the alternative, doing nothing and allowing Lena to be trafficked, was unthinkable. My mind raced with the potential outcomes, each one more terrifying than the last. Victor, sensing my turmoil, approached me one evening. His usual facade of confidence had crumbled, revealing a man caught in a web of his own making. He confessed more details about his involvement, painting a picture of a man who had made one too many wrong choices. He expressed regret, admitting that he had initially seen the operation as a way out of his financial troubles, but now realized the full horror of his actions. Victor's desperation was palpable. He feared not just for himself, but for his family, who were now under threat from Ivan's ruthless gang. His plea was a mix of guilt and self-preservation, making me more empathetic towards him. However, it also strengthened my resolve to find a solution that didn't endanger Lena further. The stakes were higher than ever, and I knew we had to act quickly. The tension reached its peak one fateful afternoon, when Ivan Petrov arrived at the villa unexpectedly, flanked by several men. The air grew thick with menace as they approached the entrance, and I felt my heart hammering in my chest. I quickly hid with Lena in one of the villa's more concealed rooms, barely breathing as we listened to the unfolding confrontation. Victor greeted Ivan, trying to maintain a facade of calm, but his voice betrayed his fear. Ivan was cold and direct, demanding that Lena be handed over immediately. The terror in Victor's voice was palpable as he tried to stall, stammering excuses about needing more time. Lena clung to me, her small body trembling with fear. As Ivan grew impatient, the situation inside the villa became increasingly volatile. Victor, realizing he had no choice, reluctantly agreed to hand Lena over, but I knew I couldn't let that happen. I had to act, and quickly. Drawing on every ounce of courage, I whispered a hurried plan to Lena. Meanwhile, Sergei, who had been nervously watching from the sidelines, gave me a slight nod, signaling his willingness to help. He moved to the kitchen, discreetly setting a small fire, a distraction to buy us precious moments. The smoke alarm's shrill beeping pierced the air, causing confusion and chaos. Ivan's men, momentarily distracted by the smoke, rushed towards the kitchen. Seizing the opportunity, I grabbed Lena's hand and we slipped out of the room, making our way toward the back door. Every step was a gamble. The villa's layout, once comforting, now felt like a maze designed to trap us. My heart pounded as we navigated through corridors and past opulent furniture, desperately avoiding any attention. The adrenaline coursing through me was the only thing keeping me focused. As we reached the back entrance, the heat from the fire intensified, adding a sense of urgency. Sergei's fire had done its job, and the chaos it caused allowed us to escape unnoticed. We fled into the dense forested hills behind the villa, running as fast as we could. The terrain was rough, and the underbrush clawed at our clothes and skin. I could hear Lena panting beside me, her small hand gripping mine tightly. Fear drove us onward, each step echoing with the terror of being caught. After what felt like hours of running, we reached the arranged meeting point with Maria. Exhaustion threatened to overtake me, but the sight of Maria, calm and resolute, was a beacon of hope. She quickly ushered us into a waiting car, her expression a mix of concern and determination. As we sped away, the tension in my body began to release, replaced by a new kind of fear, the fear of what lay ahead. The chaos of the villa seemed a distant nightmare, but the uncertain future loomed large. 
I glanced at Lena, who was pale and silent, staring out the window with wide, unseeing eyes. The gravity of what we had escaped weighed heavily on me. Not long after we left, Maria spotted one of Ivan's vehicles in the distance, clearly following us. A wave of panic washed over me, but Maria remained calm, guiding us through narrow, winding roads that only someone with intimate local knowledge could navigate. The car chase was intense, every turn and acceleration a calculated risk. My heart pounded as I looked back, the headlights of Ivan's men growing distant. Finally, after a nerve-wracking pursuit, Maria's careful planning paid off. We lost them in the twisting roads, and the sight of the safe house was a welcome relief. We had made it for now, but the road to true safety was still uncertain. At the safe house, the relief of being out of immediate danger was palpable, but I knew our journey was far from over. Maria, ever the pragmatist, immediately began outlining the next steps. We needed to move quickly to a more secure location, far away from Ivan's reach. The plan was to transport Lena and me out of the country, to a place where we could be safe and where Lena could start a new life. The logistics were daunting, involving covert transport and careful coordination with contacts Maria trusted. As I sat with Lena, the reality of the situation hit me. We were safe for now, but the threat still loomed large. I felt overwhelmed, yet deeply grateful for Maria's courage and resourcefulness. Her calm, steady presence was a beacon of hope in this storm of chaos. Media and Legal Implications Maria and I also discussed the potential impact of exposing the trafficking ring. Given my background and connections, she suggested that we could use this opportunity to bring attention to the broader issue. It was a risky proposition, with significant personal and legal implications. The thought of being thrust into the public eye, possibly facing legal scrutiny, was terrifying. However, the potential to dismantle a part of the trafficking network and protect others was a powerful motivator. We agreed that shedding light on this dark underworld could save lives, even if it meant stepping into the spotlight ourselves. Final Reflections As the days passed and plans solidified, I had time to reflect on everything that had happened. The moral complexities of my decisions weighed heavily on me. I had acted on instinct, driven by a need to protect Lena. But the consequences were far-reaching. This experience had reshaped my understanding of justice and the lengths to which one must sometimes go to uphold it. I decided to stay in touch with Maria and consider working on a broader campaign to support victims of trafficking. It felt like a natural extension of my work as a social worker, a way to channel my skills and passion into a cause that desperately needed attention. I later learned that Victor and Sergei, initially detained during the chaos, were released after cooperating with authorities. Victor, burdened with remorse, seemed determined to make amends and turn his life around. Sergei, quieter and less visible, continued to assist Maria's organization, contributing in ways that wouldn't attract undue attention. I'm Emily Thompson, an investigative journalist who recently hit burnout. The relentless pursuit of stories and constant deadlines had worn me down. Mark, my husband, is a corporate lawyer who's grown disillusioned with his job. Lately, he's been struggling with the ethical compromises that come with defending big corporations. This trip was supposed to be our chance to take a step back and reassess our lives. We both felt the need for a break, a chance to find clarity amidst the chaos of our everyday lives. As we unpacked, I hoped that this retreat would bring us the peace we both desperately needed. The cabin was charmingly rustic, with old wooden beams and a stone fireplace that looked perfect for cozy evenings. While Mark was busy setting up our things, I couldn't resist exploring a bit. The place had an old world charm, with bookshelves lining the walls filled with dusty tomes and vintage knickknacks. My curiosity got the better of me when I noticed one shelf seemed slightly off. Pushing a few books aside, I discovered a hidden compartment containing an old leather-bound journal. Excited by the find, I called Mark over. Together, we started flipping through the pages. The handwriting was neat, and as we read, we realized the journal was a detailed account of covert operations and environmental crimes. It was shocking to see such detailed records of illegal activities. 
complete with names and dates. My journalist instincts flared to life, intrigued by the potential of uncovering a major story. Mark, however, was immediately wary. He pointed out the risks of getting involved in something potentially dangerous, especially given our isolated location. While I was fascinated by the journal's contents, imagining the impact of such revelations, Mark was more pragmatic. He worried about the implications for our safety and the ethical dilemmas involved. His caution stood in stark contrast to my excitement, highlighting our different approaches to the situation. As we debated, the once serene atmosphere of the cabin began to feel a little more ominous, a shadow of unease settling over our retreat. That evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows inside the cabin, we heard a sudden noise outside. It was faint at first, a rustling, then the unmistakable sound of someone approaching. My heart raced as Mark and I exchanged worried glances. Before we could react, the door burst open, revealing a man, bloodied and limping. He collapsed into the room, gasping for breath. The shock and fear hit us both immediately. This was the last thing we expected on our quiet retreat. The man introduced himself as Alex Reyes, a former military operative turned investigative journalist. He quickly took in the journal on the table and realized we had found it. That journal, he began, his voice strained, contains everything I've gathered about a corrupt syndicate operating under the radar. They're involved in everything from illegal arms deals to environmental destruction. He explained how the journal was part of his evidence collection to expose these crimes. The depth of his knowledge and the specifics he shared made it clear this was no ordinary story. It was a dangerous web of high-stakes corruption. Alex shared his backstory with us, revealing a deep disillusionment with the government and military operations he had been part of. He had seen too much, he said, too many instances of abuse of power and corruption. His transformation from a soldier to a journalist was driven by a desire to expose the truth, no matter the cost. As he spoke, I felt a deep empathy for him. His journey mirrored my own struggles with the ethics of journalism. Mark, however, remained wary, visibly unsettled by the situation and its potential dangers. Alex detailed how he had been framed for a crime he didn't commit, a setup orchestrated by the Syndicate to silence him. Now, both law enforcement and the Syndicate were hunting him down. The cabin, he explained, was his last refuge a place he thought was safe until he could figure out his next move. His injuries were proof of a recent encounter that almost cost him his life. As Alex spoke, the gravity of our situation sank in. Mark and I discussed our options, helping Alex, fleeing, or staying neutral. My instincts as a journalist pushed me to help. This was a story that needed to be told. Mark, however, was concerned about the legal and physical risks involved. The weight of our decision loomed over us, and for the first time, the cabin felt like a trap. The next few days were filled with a growing sense of unease. It started with small, almost imperceptible signs. A drone hovering high above the treetops, its presence unsettling in the otherwise quiet forest. Then, Mark noticed an unmarked vehicle parked discreetly along the distant tree line, its occupants barely visible. Our paranoia grew with each passing hour, and the once peaceful isolation of the cabin now felt like a trap closing in on us. We were being watched, and the realization was terrifying. The constant surveillance eroded our sense of safety, and every creak of the old wooden floorboards sent us into high alert. As the signs of surveillance became more blatant, it dawned on us that the syndicate was closing in. With no phone service, and the nearest town miles away, we were effectively cut off from any help. Alex, grim-faced and more serious than ever, suggested that our only option was to escape to a nearby town where we could meet Megan Parker, his contact. Megan, he explained, was a dedicated advocate for whistleblowers and had the resources to help us get the information out safely. The idea of leaving the cabin stirred a heated debate. Megan could offer us a way out and a chance to expose the truth, but the journey was fraught with risks. I felt a strong ethical pull to bring the story to light, recognizing the journal's potential to expose significant corruption. Yet the reality of the situation weighed heavily. Mark voiced his concerns about the dangers, both legal and physical, that we faced. He argued that our involvement could make us targets, not just by the syndicate, but also by law enforcement, 
who might not distinguish between allies and enemies in this complex web. As the situation grew more dire, we decided to prepare for the worst. Alex, using his military experience, set up traps around the cabin. He explained that these would help delay any potential attackers, giving us a crucial head start. Meanwhile, Mark and I packed essentials, including the journal, carefully stowing it away among our belongings. The atmosphere was tense, filled with the urgency of an impending escape. The thought of the journey ahead was daunting, and the gravity of our situation settled heavily on our shoulders. We were stepping into the unknown, and the path forward was fraught with danger and uncertainty. The tension reached its peak as we heard the unmistakable sound of vehicles approaching. Peering through the window, I saw Ethan Ross, the Syndicate's enforcer, flanked by several men, stepping out of a black SUV. My heart pounded in my chest as Mark, Alex and I quickly hid, trying to remain as quiet as possible. Ethan's voice rang out, cold and commanding, demanding the journal. His tone left no room for negotiation. It was clear he wouldn't leave without it. Alex, ever resourceful, whispered a plan. He would create a diversion, allowing us to escape. As Ethan's men approached the door, Alex swiftly moved, setting off a series of traps around the cabin. The sudden noise and chaos outside momentarily disoriented the intruders. Taking advantage of the confusion, Alex slipped out, drawing their attention away from us. It was our moment to escape. Mark and I grabbed the journal and bolted out the back into the dense woods surrounding the cabin. As we ran, the fear and chaos of the situation became overwhelming. The sound of shouts and footsteps echoed behind us, but the traps Alex had set were doing their job, slowing down our pursuers. The darkness of the forest seemed to close in around us, making every step feel perilous. My breath came in ragged gasps, fear pushing us forward. We knew that slowing down wasn't an option. Every second counted. The dense underbrush scratched at our arms and legs, but we kept moving, driven by sheer survival instinct. Finally, we reached the rendezvous point where Megan Parker was waiting. Her calm demeanor was a stark contrast to the chaos we had just escaped. She ushered us into a waiting vehicle, and as we sped away, a brief wave of relief washed over me. For the first time in hours, I felt a glimmer of hope. Megan's presence was reassuring, a reminder that we had allies in this fight. As we drove to safety, the adrenaline began to wear off, leaving me exhausted but also resolutely focused. The fear still lingered, but so did the determination to see this through. We were no longer just running, we were moving towards a purpose. At Megan's safe house, the atmosphere was tense but secure. The exhaustion hit us all at once, a crushing wave of fatigue after the intense escape. Megan, ever the professional, laid out the plan to leak the journal's contents to the media while ensuring our identities were protected. I felt a complicated mix of relief and anxiety about the future. The weight of what we had done, the risks we had taken, settled heavily on me. We watched the news as the story broke, sparking public outrage and a swift response from the authorities. A government inquiry was announced, validating our efforts and the risks we had taken. I reflected on the power of truth, recognizing that while we had exposed the corruption, the consequences were yet to fully unfold. The potential fallout from our actions loomed large, both for us and for those involved in the scandal. As I drove up the winding mountain road, the beauty of the remote wellness retreat immediately struck me. Nestled among lush greenery, it seemed like the perfect escape from my hectic city life. I was eager to find some peace and disconnect from the daily grind. Upon arrival, Dr. Evelyn Drake, the retreat leader, greeted me with a warm smile. She exuded calm and authority, talking enthusiastically about the transformative experiences past participants had enjoyed here. Her confidence was reassuring, making me believe I was in capable hands. After settling into my cozy room, I reviewed the retreat schedule. It was packed with activities, meditation, dietary regimens, and various healing rituals. The rules were strict, specifying things like meal times and mandatory participation in all activities. I noticed that some of the rules were quite invasive, like no phones allowed and a strict curfew. While it felt a bit odd, 
I brushed it off, thinking it was part of the intensive program designed to help us detox and rejuvenate. Dr. Drake's charismatic demeanor made it hard to question these rules, and I was willing to give the program a chance, eager to experience the promised transformation. The first few days were a blur of detox diets and meditation sessions. The diet was far more restrictive than I had anticipated, consisting mostly of herbal teas and various supplements. Dr. Drake claimed these would cleanse our bodies and minds, preparing us for deeper spiritual work. However, the lack of substantial food left me feeling lightheaded and weak. The meditation sessions, led by Dr. Drake and her assistant, Jasper Hill, the head of security, were intense. We were encouraged to open our minds and let go of our worldly concerns, but the sessions often left me feeling disoriented and vulnerable instead. It was during these early days that I met Emma Garcia, a fellow participant and graphic designer searching for inspiration. We quickly bonded over our shared discomfort with some of the retreat's practices. Emma confided in me that she felt particularly uneasy about the heavy-handed security measures. Our phones were confiscated, and Jasper strictly enforced the curfew, patrolling the grounds to ensure compliance. It felt more like a boot camp than a wellness retreat. As the days passed, my unease grew. I noticed some participants becoming increasingly lethargic and compliant, their personalities dulling with each passing day. Conversations were stilted, and a few participants even seemed to vanish without any explanation. This disappearing act was alarming. Emma and I began to suspect that something was seriously wrong. One evening, while sneaking around to explore the retreat's premises, we overheard a troubling conversation between Dr. Drake and Jasper. They spoke about progress and control, words that took on a sinister tone in the context of our strange experiences. The more we observed, the more the retreat felt like a controlled experiment, rather than a place for healing. The rituals, the diet, the relentless meditation, all seemed designed to break us down mentally and physically. Emma and I decided to keep a closer watch on the situation and gather more information. However, we were acutely aware of the risks. Jasper's vigilant presence and Dr. Drake's soothing but increasingly manipulative reassurances made it clear that we were always being watched. The retreat, once a sanctuary, was quickly becoming a place of suspicion and fear. One night, with the weight of our suspicions pressing on us, Emma and I decided to take a risky plunge. While everyone else was asleep, we sneaked into Dr. Drake's office. The stillness of the night only heightened our nerves. Every creak of the floorboards felt like a potential alarm. As we rummaged through her files, our hands shaking, we uncovered something horrifying. Detailed records of each participant's psychological profile lay before us along with meticulous notes on the effects of the retreat's activities. It was clear. The herbal supplements, the restrictive diets, and the intense meditation sessions were all part of a larger, sinister experiment. Dr. Drake and her co-researcher, Dr. Marcus Lane, were conducting a mind control study, using us as unsuspecting subjects. As we continued our search, we found a locked cabinet. Emma managed to pry it open, revealing a stash of stronger drugs and invasive equipment. The sight sent a chill down my spine. The files indicated that some participants had been subjected to more extreme methods, likely the reason behind their sudden compliance or disappearance. Emma found a file on herself, detailing her creative block and how susceptible she was to suggestion. My own file wasn't any less disturbing. It detailed my high stress levels and marked me as ready for deep conditioning. As we quietly left the office, we almost bumped into Dr. Lane. The shock was mutual. He looked surprised but not entirely alarmed, which gave us a small window to confront him. Emma, barely holding back her anger, demanded answers about the experiments. Dr. Lane, clearly conflicted, confessed that he had always had reservations about Dr. Drake's methods. However, his curiosity about unlocking the human mind's potential had kept him involved. He explained that participants were selected based on their psychological profiles, making them ideal subjects for the experiment's various phases. Dr. Lane's demeanor was different from Dr. Drake's cold authority. He seemed genuinely troubled by the situation. He admitted to documenting his concerns and suggested we use these notes to expose the retreat's true purpose. However, 
He warned us that Dr. Drake was highly dangerous and that Jasper, her enforcer, would go to any lengths to maintain control. This conversation confirmed our worst fears, but also gave us a slight edge. We had an ally, however reluctant. Determined to expose the truth, Emma and I decided to gather more evidence before attempting to escape. We secretly recorded conversations between Dr. Drake and Jasper. The recordings were chilling. Dr. Drake spoke coldly about the progress of the participants and the success of their mind control techniques. She detailed plans to expand the experiment, targeting larger groups and refining the methods to be undetectable. It was clear that if left unchecked, their ambitions could lead to widespread abuse. However, our increased caution didn't go unnoticed. Jasper began monitoring us more closely, restricting our movements and questioning us aggressively. The atmosphere at the retreat grew oppressive, each passing day feeling like a tightening noose. Emma and I knew our time was running out. We had to act before Dr. Drake and Jasper realized the full extent of what we knew. The stakes were high. Failure to escape could mean losing our freedom, or worse. The thought of being trapped in their care forever was terrifying, but it only fueled our resolve to bring their dark practices to light. The atmosphere at the retreat reached an unbearable level of tension. It all came to a head when Jasper, visibly angry, escorted another participant, clearly under heavy sedation, out of the main building. The sight sent a jolt of fear through me and Emma. It was clear that waiting any longer could be fatal for us or others. We decided it was time to act. That night, under the cover of darkness, we broke into Dr. Lane's office to retrieve the crucial notes. Just as we were gathering the evidence, Dr. Drake walked in. Her usually calm demeanor cracked, revealing a cold, calculating core. She looked at us with disdain, mocking our attempts to expose her. Dr. Drake spoke with a chilling detachment about her vision for the future, where her techniques could control entire populations for the greater good. As Dr. Drake called for Jasper, panic set in. We grabbed as many of Dr. Lane's notes and files as we could, knowing these were our lifeline. Jasper appeared almost instantly, blocking our escape route. A physical struggle ensued, one that felt surreal and terrifying. Jasper was strong and well-trained, easily overpowering us. Just as it seemed all was lost, Dr. Lane intervened. His face was a mask of conflict, torn between his loyalty to Dr. Drake and the moral weight of their actions. His hesitation was all we needed. In the confusion, Emma and I managed to slip past Jasper, clutching the incriminating evidence. We ran through the compound, adrenaline pumping, desperate to reach the main gate. The other participants, some of whom were too subdued to respond, looked on blankly. It was heartbreaking and terrifying to see their blank, unseeing eyes, victims of the experiment. Jasper was hot on our heels, relentless in his pursuit. We ducked into the kitchen, frantically barricading the door with whatever we could find. Our breath was ragged, our hearts racing. Dr. Lane, in a final act of defiance against Dr. Drake, distracted Jasper, giving us a critical moment to escape through a back exit. The cold night air hit us as we burst out into the woods surrounding the retreat. The path was barely visible, treacherous and winding. Every crack of a branch, every rustle of leaves felt like the sound of pursuit. Our fear drove us forward, our only thought being to reach safety and expose the truth. Just as we reached a small clearing, Jasper caught up. A desperate struggle ensued. He was determined to stop us. In the chaos, Jasper was injured. We didn't stop to see the extent of his injuries. We used the momentary reprieve to keep running, our lungs burning and our bodies exhausted. Finally, battered and breathless, we stumbled into a small town. We made our way to the police station, our last hope. But as we reached the steps, we saw Dr. Drake and a limping Jasper arrive, their faces set in grim determination. The confrontation that followed was intense. Dr. Drake tried to downplay the situation, her voice smooth and composed, but Emma and I were beyond caring for appearances. We presented the evidence we had gathered, our words tumbling over each other in our desperation to be believed. The police, initially skeptical, began to take us seriously as Dr. Lane arrived, backing up our story. 
He provided additional evidence, confirming the unethical nature of the experiments. The townspeople, drawn by the commotion, watched in shock as the truth came out. The police detained Dr. Drake and Jasper, their faces betraying their realization of the gravity of the situation. As the authorities took control, Emma and I finally felt a sense of safety wash over us. The nightmare was ending, and we had survived, ready to see justice done. After a grueling few months at work, I finally arrived at a charming bed and breakfast nestled in a picturesque village. I was looking forward to a peaceful retreat, a chance to escape the stress and recharge. The property, run by Evelyn Harrington, immediately struck me with its quaint charm. Evelyn greeted me warmly, her smile wide and inviting as she showed me around the meticulously maintained grounds and the cozy interior of the house. Everything was immaculate, almost too perfect, with a distinct touch of care that spoke to Evelyn's personality. As she led me to my room, Evelyn mentioned her background as a nurse, which explained her strictness about cleanliness. She seemed almost obsessive about keeping everything spotless, pointing out various features designed for optimal hygiene. At the time, I brushed it off as harmless eccentricity, thinking it was just part of her attention to detail and professionalism. I settled into my room, appreciating the peacefulness of the setting and the promise of a relaxing few days. Little did I know, this serene facade hid something far more sinister beneath its surface. Over the next few days, I took the time to explore the village, enjoying the scenic views and indulging in the local cuisine. The village had a timeless quality to it, with narrow cobblestone streets and friendly locals. During my explorations, I met another guest, Sophie Martin, who claimed to be a tourist just like me. Sophie was friendly, but there was something about the way she asked questions about my stay and the bed and breakfast that seemed a bit probing. Nevertheless, we struck up a casual friendship, sharing meals and discussing the local sites. It wasn't long before I began to notice subtle oddities. Evelyn's interest in her guest's health seemed unusually keen. She insisted on preparing all the meals, carefully selecting the ingredients, and paying close attention to our dietary preferences. It felt overly controlling, but I didn't think much of it initially. Then there was Marcus Kane, introduced as the handyman. There was something off about him. His demeanor was cold and detached, and he seemed to be lurking around at odd hours. One evening, I accidentally overheard a conversation between Evelyn and Marcus. The tone was tense, and their discussion was filled with medical jargon that I barely understood. I caught phrases like, the next shipment, and vital signs, which piqued my curiosity and concern. Something about the way they spoke, combined with their secretive behavior, raised a red flag. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong here. My suspicions deepened when I noticed Sophie taking an unusual interest in the comings and goings around the bed and breakfast. She seemed more observant than a typical tourist, often glancing at Evelyn and Marcus with a scrutinizing eye. One night, she pulled me aside, her voice low and urgent. She warned me to be careful, hinting at something sinister happening but stopped short of explaining fully. Her warning only added to my growing unease making me more determined to find out what was really going on in this seemingly idyllic place. The gnawing suspicion was too much to ignore, so I decided to take matters into my own hands. One afternoon, while Evelyn and Marcus were out, I seized the opportunity to explore the restricted areas of the house. I managed to pick the lock on a door leading to the basement, which Evelyn had previously claimed was just for storage. As I descended the stairs, a chill ran down my spine. The basement was more than just storage. It was a makeshift medical facility. I saw medical equipment neatly arranged, including surgical tools, IV stands, and a refrigeration unit. But what caught my attention were the vials labeled with various drugs, sedatives and muscle relaxants, names I recognized from basic medical knowledge. My stomach turned as I spotted a filing cabinet. Inside were detailed files on past guests, including medical histories and blood types. My heart raced as the horrifying realization set in. Evelyn and Marcus were involved in organ trafficking. They targeted healthy guests, drugged them, and harvested their organs. My hand shook as I flipped through the files, coming across disturbing notes about suitable matches and client preferences. Among the files, 
I found a note suggesting that Sophie might not be just another guest. Her records were sparse, and there were indications she might have been asking too many questions. This made me suspect that Sophie could be more than she appeared. Later that evening, I confronted Sophie, carefully choosing my words. She hesitated, but eventually confessed. She was indeed an investigative journalist, undercover, and working on a story about a series of missing persons cases linked to the bed and breakfast. She had been gathering evidence, suspecting that Evelyn and Marcus were behind an organ trafficking operation. Sophie explained her plan. She aimed to gather enough proof to expose them, but needed solid evidence to make the case. We decided to team up. Sophie would try to record a conversation with Evelyn, hoping to get a confession, or at least some incriminating statements. Meanwhile, I would try to gather more physical evidence. We both knew the risks involved. If caught, we would likely become their next victims. As we executed our plan, Evelyn's suspicions seemed to grow. She questioned me about my interest in the village and the guests, her demeanor turning colder. She subtly warned me not to stray into private areas, and I noticed Marcus following me more closely around the property. The pressure was mounting. Any misstep could be disastrous. Sophie, meanwhile, managed to engage Evelyn in a conversation that she covertly recorded. Evelyn spoke cryptically about special clients and arrangements, enough to suggest illegal activities, but not enough to serve as solid evidence. It was a nerve-wracking game of cat and mouse. We knew that what we had wasn't sufficient to blow the operation wide open. We needed something more concrete, something that could definitively link Evelyn and Marcus to the disappearances and the organ trafficking ring. Determined to uncover the full extent of Evelyn and Marcus's operation, Sophie and I decided to make one last attempt to gather definitive evidence. We returned to the basement, this time breaking into a heavily secured room we hadn't accessed before. Inside, we discovered a horrifying setup. A fully equipped surgical area, complete with operating tables, bright lights, and all the tools needed for organ harvesting. The sight of the sterile, cold environment sent chills down my spine. This was where they were butchering innocent people. As we documented the scene, taking photographs and collecting any evidence we could find, the sound of footsteps behind us made my heart drop. Evelyn and Marcus stood in the doorway, their faces a mask of fury and menace. Evelyn's usual facade of hospitality vanished. Coldly, she explained how they had been running this organ trafficking ring for years, exploiting vulnerable tourists who stumbled into their trap. Her voice was devoid of emotion as she detailed the process, from selecting suitable victims to arranging the deliveries. It was as if she were describing a mundane business operation. Evelyn's calm demeanor cracked as she threatened us, making it clear that if we didn't cooperate, we'd be the next donors. The walls seemed to close in as the reality of our situation set in. We were trapped with a woman who had no qualms about killing us to protect her operation. As Evelyn and Marcus advanced, ready to subdue us, adrenaline kicked in. In a desperate move, Sophie and I fought back. In the chaos, we managed to knock Marcus into the basement and lock the door, temporarily trapping him. Evelyn, however, slipped away, her footsteps echoing ominously as she retreated. We knew we had little time before she returned with reinforcements or worse. Panicking, we fled the house and ran towards the village, hoping to find help but the village was eerily quiet, as if the residents were complicit or too terrified to intervene. Every shadow seemed threatening, every closed door a silent rebuke. It felt like we were in a ghost town, with no one willing to stand up to the horrors being perpetrated right under their noses. As we stumbled through the deserted streets, Evelyn caught up with us. A struggle ensued, more desperate and chaotic than any of us had anticipated. Sophie frantically dialed for help on her phone while I confronted Evelyn. In a burst of anger and fear, I taunted her, calling out her hypocrisy. Here was a woman obsessed with cleanliness and order, yet running one of the dirtiest operations imaginable. My words seemed to strike a nerve. Evelyn's calm facade crumbled, replaced by rage. Distracted, Evelyn made a critical misstep. I took the opportunity to overpower her, using all the strength I could muster. Just as we managed to incapacitate her, Marcus broke free from the basement, adding a fresh wave of terror to the situation. It felt like a nightmare with no end. But then, as if by a miracle, 
headlights cut through the night. Henry Larson, the local detective who had been quietly investigating the disappearances, arrived just in time. He quickly assessed the situation, moving with the calm authority of someone who had seen it all. As he handcuffed Evelyn and Marcus, a wave of relief washed over me. We were safe, and justice was finally catching up to these monsters. But the ordeal wasn't over. There was still much to uncover and process. As the adrenaline faded, I realized how close we had come to becoming just another pair of missing tourists. With the situation under control, Detective Henry Larson swiftly arrested Evelyn and Marcus, handcuffing them and reading their rights. As the police took over, Larson explained to Sophie and me that he had been investigating Evelyn for some time, but had been unable to gather enough solid evidence to act. Our discovery in the basement and the recording Sophie had made were the missing pieces he needed to bring their operation to a halt. At the police station, we provided detailed testimonies of what we had witnessed and experienced. The police meticulously documented the evidence we had collected, including the surgical equipment and drugs in the basement, alongside Sophie's incriminating recordings. The bed and breakfast was permanently shut down, and Evelyn and Marcus were set to face trial. The revelations shocked the local community, but gradually, the truth settled in, bringing a collective sigh of relief and a call for justice. At the police station, Emma and I provided full statements about everything that transpired at the retreat. Detective Johnson, the officer in charge, listened attentively, nodding as we recounted the harrowing details. He praised our bravery, assuring us that the authorities would conduct a thorough investigation into the retreat's practices. It was a relief to feel believed and supported after such a terrifying ordeal. Dr. Lane, looking deeply remorseful, provided a detailed confession. He corroborated our claims and added further insights into the experiments, revealing the dangerous potential of the data they had collected. He emphasized that, in the wrong hands, such techniques could be used for widespread manipulation and control. Arriving in the bustling city for a month-long freelance project, I felt a mix of excitement and anticipation. The loft I rented through an upscale service seemed perfect, spacious, well-decorated, and filled with beautiful art pieces. Jonathan Blake, the manager and self-proclaimed art dealer, greeted me warmly. He was charming and sophisticated with a polished manner that immediately put me at ease. However, his rules were unusually strict including bizarre fines for minor infractions like leaving shoes out of place or adjusting the artwork. I chalked it up to his meticulous nature, typical of someone deeply involved in the art world. In the days that followed, I took advantage of my time in the city to explore its vibrant neighborhoods, cafes, and art galleries. The city was a hub of creativity, and I relished the opportunity to soak in the culture. It was during one of these outings that I met Sophie Martin, a friendly and engaging woman staying in a nearby loft. We quickly bonded over our shared love of art, spending hours discussing various exhibitions and artists. However, Sophie's curiosity about my loft and Jonathan raised my suspicions. She seemed particularly interested in the art pieces and Jonathan's role as a dealer. As I spent more time in the loft, Jonathan's behavior became increasingly odd. He was overly concerned with the condition of the art often adjusting pieces and insisting they be handled with extreme care. His assistant, Elise Navarro, was frequently present, working on various artworks. Elise seemed talented but stressed, as if under immense pressure. Jonathan's rules extended to strange specifics, like not touching the art or moving certain items, which struck me as overly controlling. One evening, while passing by Jonathan's office, I overheard a heated discussion between him and Elise. They were talking about authentication and client specifications, which sounded like they were discussing something illegal. My curiosity was piqued. It seemed like more than just typical art dealing jargon. Sophie's subtle hints and veiled warnings about Jonathan's reputation began to make more sense. She had mentioned hearing rumors about questionable practices in the local art scene, which now seemed all too relevant. I started paying closer attention to the artwork around the loft. Some pieces seemed almost too perfect, lacking the imperfections and character of genuine works. It was as if they were reproductions, high quality but not authentic. This realization added to my growing unease, 
making me suspect that the art in the loft might not be what it seemed. The more I thought about it, the more convinced I became that something shady was going on, and I needed to find out what it was. Determined to uncover the truth, I waited for the perfect opportunity when Jonathan was out. My heart pounded as I sneaked into his private office, knowing that I was crossing a dangerous line. The office was immaculate, just like the rest of the loft, but it had a distinctly more clinical feel. I quickly began searching through the neatly organized files and drawers. My breath caught when I found detailed records of art sales, including multiple listings of what seemed to be the same painting sold as originals. The descriptions were too similar, down to the minor imperfections one would expect only in a master forger's work. Continuing my search, I stumbled upon a hidden door that led to a studio, concealed behind a false wall. The studio was a revelation. There were half-finished paintings that were unmistakably copies of famous artworks. Tools for aging the paintings, from chemical baths to UV lights, were scattered around, clearly used to give the pieces an artificially aged look. This was more than just a forgery operation. It was a full-scale production line for counterfeit art. In a locked cabinet, I found forged certificates of authenticity and correspondences with various buyers. It was clear. Jonathan was not just dabbling in art. He was deeply entrenched in an international art forgery ring. The documents hinted at a network of dealers and collectors who either didn't care about the legality or were willfully ignorant, buying these counterfeits as though they were real. The scale of the operation was staggering and dangerous, all under the guise of a legitimate business. I couldn't keep this discovery to myself. When I confronted Sophie, she revealed that she was actually an undercover investigative journalist. She had suspected Jonathan for a while and was working to expose the forgery ring. Sophie explained that Jonathan used the lofts not only to store and create forged art, but also to house unsuspecting guests. These guests could be duped into unwittingly participating in the scam, either as buyers or by providing cover for illicit meetings. Together, we formulated a plan. Sophie would continue to gather audio and video recordings of incriminating conversations, while I would maintain my cover as an innocent guest, observing and documenting any suspicious activities. Sophie warned me about the risks, emphasizing that people involved in such operations could be very dangerous if they felt threatened. But despite the fear gnawing at me, I felt a strong resolve to bring Jonathan to justice. As our investigation progressed, Jonathan's demeanor shifted. He became more erratic and suspicious, as if sensing that something was amiss. Elise, who was usually composed, looked increasingly distressed. It was clear the pressure was getting to them. One evening, Jonathan confronted me, casually asking about my interest in art and subtly probing whether I had been exploring places I shouldn't. I played dumb, feigning disinterest. But the tension was palpable. He wasn't buying it completely. Sophie managed to record a crucial conversation where Jonathan discussed a major upcoming deal involving a particularly valuable forgery. This deal could be the key to exposing the entire operation. However, the stakes had never been higher. Jonathan's paranoia seemed to reach a peak, and he instructed Elise to restrict my access to certain areas, making it even more challenging to gather the necessary evidence. We were playing a dangerous game, and the cost of losing was more than we could afford. Desperate for irrefutable evidence, Sophie and I decided to take a significant risk. We targeted Jonathan's private storage room, knowing it would contain the most incriminating proof of his crimes. The room was heavily secured, but with some quick thinking and a bit of luck, we managed to bypass the security system. Inside, we found an overwhelming collection of forged artworks, meticulously stored alongside the original pieces they mimicked. The setup was chilling tools for aging the paintings, chemicals for altering colors, and even handwritten notes detailing the forging process. The sheer scale of the operation was staggering and left no doubt about the depth of Jonathan's criminal activities. As we documented everything, our sense of victory was abruptly shattered. Jonathan and Elise burst into the room, alerted by a silent alarm we had inadvertently triggered. The atmosphere turned electric with tension. Jonathan's usually smooth demeanor vanished replaced by a cold, calculating look. He didn't bother with pleasantries. Instead, he laid bare the full extent of his scheme, boasting about how he exploited the naivety and greed of collectors. 
His voice, dripping with contempt, outlined his contempt for the art world that had shunned him, using these scams as both revenge and a source of immense profit. His warning was stark. If we didn't cooperate, no one would ever find us. The threat hung heavy in the air, chilling me to the core. The situation quickly escalated as Jonathan and Elise moved to restrain us. In the ensuing chaos, adrenaline surged through me. We had no choice but to fight back. I managed to shove Elise into the storage room, locking her inside. However, Jonathan slipped away in the confusion, likely to call for backup or something far worse. Panic set in, and Sophie and I knew we had to act fast. We bolted from the building, our hearts racing as we sprinted through the city's labyrinthine streets. Every corner felt like a potential ambush. The city, usually bustling and welcoming, now seemed menacing. The vibrant streets felt oppressive, as if everyone knew the dangerous secret we had uncovered. We were acutely aware that Jonathan could be just around the corner, and each glance over our shoulders was filled with dread. The urgency to reach safety was overwhelming. Every second counted. We were within sight of the police station when Jonathan appeared, cutting off our path. The confrontation was immediate and violent. The bustling street came to a halt as bystanders watched in shock. Sophie, clutching her phone, frantically dialed for help while I faced Jonathan. The veneer of civilization had completely fallen away. This was a desperate, dangerous man. I called him out on his hypocrisy, on the irony of his obsession with perfection in his forgeries while running such a sordid business. My words seemed to strike a nerve, and the confrontation turned physical. In a brief moment of distraction, I found an opening. I pushed Jonathan hard, sending him stumbling back. He fell to the ground, dazed. Just then, Detective Laura Bennett arrived on the scene, having been tipped off by Sophie's call. She moved swiftly, her presence commanding and authoritative. Jonathan was immediately subdued and arrested, while other officers secured the area. The relief was palpable, but the adrenaline still coursed through me, making everything feel surreal. Detective Bennett quickly assessed the situation, ensuring Sophie and I were safe and collecting the evidence we had gathered. The police presence grew as more officers arrived, securing the loft and beginning a thorough investigation. The nightmare was over, but the aftermath was just beginning. Jonathan's operation was dismantled, and his accomplices, including Elise, were taken into custody. The truth of the art forgery ring was finally out in the open, thanks to our risky but necessary actions. At the police station, Sophie and I provided detailed accounts of everything we uncovered. It was surreal, recounting the events to Detective Bennett and her team. Bennett praised our bravery, admitting that they had been closing in on Jonathan but lacked the critical evidence we provided. It felt strange to be called brave when, in the moment, I had just felt terrified. Elise, who had initially been combative and defensive, began to cooperate under questioning. She provided deeper insights into the forgery operation, hoping for leniency. Her cooperation promised to unravel even more of the network than we had initially uncovered.